If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, and this morning we're looking at verses 16 to 18, Galatians 5, 16 to 18. And Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh has its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Amen. Will you join me in prayer, please? He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, obviously by the topic and by the passage, uh, this morning we're talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, as some of you may be aware, Often Presbyterian type denominations are often criticized because we don't give due credence in the eyes of some to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I hope that this, sir, this message will be very helpful and meaningful to all of us today. Um, and in an attempt to encourage us to remain vigilant and to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, I want to begin by sharing a quote that I've shared with you before to help set the stage. Someone once said that everyone in the church, and you'll remember this, is either in a ditch, coming out of a ditch, or on their way to a ditch. And <clears throat> those two ditches, if you can think about walking down a narrow path, those two ditches can be the ditch of legalism on the one side that we can fall into, or uh, the theological word is antinomianism on the other side, anti meaning without law, which would represent a irresponsible life, using our Christian liberties uh, beyond what we should be doing. So the question before us is, how do we avoid those ditches? Um, how do we uh, enjoy the freedom that Christ has called us to? You remember earlier uh, in our study, Paul says in one of the verses in Galatians that it was for freedom that Christ died to set you free. So the question is, how do we continue to walk in freedom without falling into a ditch? And that's kind of what we want to think about this morning. Uh, one of our own beloved gave me a little uh, piece of paper with a quote that we referenced, I think, last week. Freedom is not the right to do what you please. It's the power to do what is right. And that's, uh, that, how, how true is that? Now, you remember last week as we looked at freedom, we saw that it expresses itself in three ways. We saw that last week. Self-control, in loving service towards our neighbor, and in obeying God's moral law. That's what we looked at last week. Those are the marks of a Christian. Those are the marks of someone who has been set free by the Lord due to salvation, due to conversion. So the question before us now is how can I continue in this freedom without falling into a ditch, without becoming overly legalistic in my Christian life or irresponsible? And Paul gives us the answer this morning in our text. And he says the answer is by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who can keep us truly free. The Holy Spirit is presented in our passage as our sanctifier. The one who can oppose and subdue 
the struggles that we continue to have, that ongoing fallenness and the sinful desires that remain in us. The Holy Spirit is presented as the one who enables us to fulfill the law, as the one who causes us to stop living selfishly and to start loving other people. So the experience of Christian freedom depends on the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, in our passage, we want to see this morning, first of all, the command to walk by the Spirit. Second, the result of walking by the Spirit. Thirdly, the conflict of walking by the Spirit. And finally, the freedom of walking by the Spirit. Let's look first of all then at the command to walk by the Spirit. Look at the first part of verse 16. Paul simply says, But I say, walk by the Spirit. Peripateo is the word. And it's in the present tense and the imperative mood. Okay, the fact that it's in the present tense indicates that Paul is speaking here of a continuous action an ongoing way of life, a daily thing, a lifestyle, if you will. We are to daily walk by the Spirit. Now the verb is also in the imperative mood, which means that Paul is giving us a command here. Now what does that tell us? Well, for one thing it tells us that that's not natural for me. It's not going to happen all the time, right? It's not my default, necessarily. I need to be exhorted. I need to be commanded to daily walk by the Spirit. Now, among other things, walking implies progress. Going from where I am now to where God wants to bring me, to where God wants to take me. And it's as we submit to the Spirit's control and his leading that we move forward in our spiritual lives. Now again, we immediately understand the tension. And what we try to want to try to understand is the balance between God's sovereign work in this and my responsibility. Um, while it's the Holy Spirit who's the power source, you and I are the ones who are commanded in verse 16 to walk by the Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit uses things in our lives, things that we do, things like Bible study, things like gathering here, like we have on the Lord's Day for corporate worship, uh, witnessing to our neighbors, giving ourselves to prayer, daily choices we make on when I'm at a crossroads, here's God's will, here's my will, You know, he uses, the Holy Spirit uses all of those things to move us ahead in our spiritual lives. But we don't look to the disciplines. We don't trust in the disciplines. Rather, we trust in, we're looking to the Holy Spirit. And that's such a reminder to me. Okay, how often do we want to look to the things, these, those disciplines in and of themselves and to trust in our commitment to those things rather than daily looking to the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit as the key? And when we trust in certain behavioral standards, now they're standards God's given us in His Word. Or when we measure our spirituality by how frequently we're engaged in those things, see, that's when we're setting ourselves up to fall in a ditch, to become either overly legalistic or irresponsible. So we don't want to do that. Now there's a balance. And on the one hand, we, we're, I'm trying to emphasize that it's the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live the Christian life. On the other hand, that doesn't mean we just sort of passively sit back, right, and, and, and watch. Okay, there's a tension. Now, 
Tension is good. We've talked about that before. Um, <coughs> the Bible's full of tension. The Christian life is full of tension. As a matter of fact, I would submit to you that people who are living without tension are in a dangerous spot. That's not a good place to be. Christians who have lost this tension between God's sovereignty and our responsibility may have slipped into a ditch. Either a sort of a let go and let God mentality which can lead to irresponsibility or into an approach in your walk with the Lord as an orphan where you've sort of forgotten altogether that God has given you a power source to live the Christian life. If your Christian life is more of like, well, it's all up to me and you've forgotten adoption and all the resources that are ours and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and so forth. So, we're commanded to walk by the Spirit. Okay, now, how do we do this? What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? I think it begins with a particular kind of attitude. Or, or a daily mindset. I think that's where it starts. To walk by the Spirit means that I recognize, first of all, my daily need to be filled with the Spirit, to be empowered by the Spirit. You remember the words of our Lord in Luke chapter 11. Jesus asked, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, we should continually be asking the Father... We have the Holy Spirit, but we should always be asking the Father to fill us with the Holy Spirit, to release the Holy Spirit in our lives and so forth. We receive Him when we become a Christian, but are we seeking Him to release His power in our lives? So to walk by the Spirit, I would say, is, starts with an attitude. It's basically a longing for God to live his life through me, for God to control, be in control, and so forth. Now, having said that, to walk by the Spirit is more than just an attitude. Okay, that, that, I think that's where it starts. But there's also active steps that I can take. For one thing, to walk by the Spirit means that I need to be willing to follow where he leads, right? Right? And so I read God's Word, and let's say God speaks to me about something, an area in my life, something that's going on that's personalized to my situation and so forth. Am I willing to follow the Spirit's prompting in that, in that moment, in that situation, in that area the Spirit prompts and I follow? If I don't follow, then I'm not doing my part. And rather than walking by the Spirit, I'm doing what Paul described elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm quenching the Spirit, or I'm grieving the Spirit. So actively speaking, I also walk by the Spirit as I saturate my life with Jesus Christ, His person, His Word. To walk by the Spirit is to live in moment-by-moment -moment awareness of His presence and His will. Remember what David said in the Psalms, I have set the Lord continually before me. That's part of what it means to walk by the Spirit. I practice His presence moment-by-moment. Moment. I evaluate the things I'm doing, the things that I'm uh, thinking about in the light of His Word, in the light of His will. See, that's why it's crucial, the Lord's Day is crucial. When you come here, we hear God's Word being taught. It's also crucial that we have daily devotions 
that we're constantly renewing our minds, filling our minds with a steady diet of His Word. Through prayer and meditating in His Word, I practice His presence all day long. And I seek to incorporate His will into everything I do. And when I blow it, and I blow it, I will blow it, I confess it. I turn from it. I look to Him again and say, Lord, You take over that area again in my life. You give me the power and the blessing of your spirit to give me the desire and the strength to subdue that area of my life and to see it brought in accordance in line with your word. That's what it means to walk by the spirit. So we see the command. We're to walk by the spirit. He's our power for living. He's the one who enables us to subdue those old desires that are still very real in our lives. He's the one who allows us, empowers us to embrace and fulfill God's moral law from the heart. He's the one that enables us to lovingly serve those around us and to avoid the ditches. Well, secondly... We see the result of walking by the Spirit. Look at verse 16 again. Walk by the Spirit, Paul says, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Okay, there's the result. We don't carry out the desires of the flesh. Now notice, the verse does not say you won't have those desires. Okay, it says you won't carry them out. Big difference. Sometimes people feel guilty when they're tempted. We're going to be tempted the rest of our lives. You can't live in our day and age. You can't watch any kind of TV or read any kind of literature or, or see what's going on politically and, and you know, not be tempted with emotions and feelings that are, you, know, you know are contrary to godliness. It's not sin to be tempted. Where we get into trouble is when we nurse that temptation. When we pander to it, when we dwell on it in our minds, when we feed upon it and so forth. Paul says or tells us that if we walk by the Spirit, if we keep in step with the Spirit's leading, even though we're going to be tempted, we won't carry out those desires. So we see the command to walk by the Spirit. We see the result of walking by the Spirit. We don't carry out the desires of the flesh. Thirdly, we see the conflict of walking by the Spirit. Look at verse 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. And the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Now, this verse makes it clear to us, doesn't it, that walking by the spirit is not simply a matter of passive surrender. Rather, the spirit-led life, Paul says, is a life of conflict. Because if you're following the Spirit's leading in your life, then you're constantly going to be combating the old man, right? The old nature that's still there. As a matter of fact, I would take it a step further and say to you that such inner conflict is really a test of the genuineness of your Christian faith isn't it? The fact that there is such conflict, because only as a Christian do I have God's Spirit living inside of me. And only as a Christian will I know something of this conflict. See, if, if a person's content, completely content with a life of selfishness, self-centeredness, sinfulness, and so forth, 
they should examine their relationship with the Lord. I think non-Christians can truly be regretful for decisions they've made, but they don't have a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare going on inside of them because the Holy Spirit doesn't live in them, see? But for a Christian, there's a battle going on. If we're walking by the Spirit, the flesh is that part of us that functions apart from and against the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives. And the more we follow and obey the Spirit, the more we're going to be battling against the desires, the fleshly desires that still remain. So expect that. We should expect conflict a measure of conflict if we're living a spirit-filled life. And that conflict is really evidence that I'm obeying the Spirit's leading, that I'm trying to walk by the Spirit. Finally, having seen the command to walk by the Spirit, the result of walking by the Spirit, and the conflict of walking by the Spirit, we see the freedom of walking in the Spirit. Look at verse 18. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You know, there's great freedom uh, in the Spirit-filled life, in keeping in step with the Spirit, in walking by the Spirit. To live under the law is to live by the flesh. See, and if I'm looking to my own strength, to overcome sinful desires or tendencies in my Christian life, then I've forgotten, see, that it's by the Holy Spirit that I can know victory. My flesh is powerless to fulfill the law. There's no way I can live up to God's standards in my own strength, and yet we try all the time, don't we? You remember what Paul said back in chapter 3? In verse 3 of Galatians, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? The law is powerless to conquer the sinful desires of our flesh. There's nothing inherent in the law that will give me power over sin. The purpose of the law was to reveal sin to me. See, to stir up my awareness of sin that still dwells in my heart so that I'll look somewhere else. So that I'll look to the Lord and I'll look to His Holy Spirit, His power in my life to bring victory. In his book, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan describes Interpreter's House, which Pilgrim went to during his journey to the celestial city. The parlor of the house was completely covered in dust. And when a man took a broom and he started to sweep, he and the others began to choke from all the, the dust that was stirred up. The more he swept, the more suffocating the dust became. And then interpreter ordered a maid to come in and sprinkle the room with water. And the dust was washed away. Interpreter explained to Pilgrim that the parlor represented the heart of an unconverted man. That the dust was his sin, the man with the broom was the law, and the maid with the water was the gospel. And his point was that all the law can do with sin is stir it up. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can wash it away. And only the Spirit of God can continue to give me daily strength and power to put sin to death in my life. As I walk by the Spirit, as I yield to his power in daily living, I'm no longer under the law, Paul says. I'm no longer held captive by its power. To the contrary, 
I fulfill its demands as I let Christ by his spirit live through me. And my Christian life, see, then is one of balance, one of liberty and joy, not irresponsibility on the one hand, that's one ditch, or legalism on the other. It's one of joy. Remember the passage in 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome, right? That's the balance. Uh, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in other words, this life, this journey I'm on now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I look to him. I don't live it by trying to muster it up myself, try to be a better person or a better Christian. I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the key to freedom, the power for the Christian life is the Holy Spirit. Now, we receive the Holy Spirit when we become Christians. We receive the Holy Spirit when we receive Christ into our lives. But daily, am I seeking him to fill me, to empower me, to, to, to enable me to live the way God wants me to live? And when I blow it, and I will, I do, every day, every week. Like 1 John 1, 9, I simply confess it. God is faithful and just to forgive us when we confess our sins, and then I turn back to him in that moment. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me to live in a way that honors you in this area. And I try to turn it, and I'm going to have to do it again and again and again with some things, not with everything, but with some things. But that's what it means to walk by the Spirit. And when I do that, Paul says, I will not carry out the desires of the flesh. What about it? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Another way to ask that is, have you received Christ? Because when we receive Him, He comes to live in us in the power of of the Holy Spirit. If you have, are you walking daily by the Spirit? Or would you say your Christian life is more characterized by struggle as an orphan, feeling like it's all up to me? Have you forgotten the resources and the power that God gives us to live the Christian life? Amen. Will you join me in prayer? As our hearts are bowed this morning, are you walking by the Spirit, moment by moment? Have you received the Spirit? It's another way of asking, have you received Jesus Christ into your heart? If you haven't, you can do that right now. You can pray these words silently in your heart as you listen. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Cleanse me, forgive me, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, from this moment forward, enable me to live my life the way that you created me to live. I pray it in your name. Amen. Now if you'll stand for the benediction.